This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you all so much for the support and for tuning in. You can follow Planet Microcap on Twitter at Bobby K. Craft, and you are listening to episode 156. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to tweet at me or shoot me an email at rcraft at snnwire.com. And when you do have a chance, if you like what you hear, please rate and review Planet Microcap on iTunes. It really helps provide feedback for me and spread the Microcap message. The first episode of the year didn't have my, my normal intro, so I'd like to take this time to wish everyone a very happy new year. It's already been a, a little hectic 2021, to say the least, uh, you know, just welcoming in the new year and, and just finishing up a conference last week. So uh, I just wanted to take the time to say happy new year. Thank you all again for all of your support. We got a ton on the table this year for 2021 for podcasts to events. So again, thank you for tuning in. And, uh, you know, we look forward to you listening and all that good stuff for 2021 and be safe, please, you know, still be safe. So I also like to thank everyone who participated in last week's SNN Network Canada virtual event. The level of support and engagement was beyond every expectation. And really, that's all thanks to you. So if you missed any keynote presentation or educational panel, they are all up on our YouTube channel right now. And every company presentation is archived on the conference website, which is canada.snn.network under the tab archived presentations. All the content from the event will be up on our YouTube channel shortly. Again, that's www.youtube.com slash SNN wire. Uh, as I said a little earlier, we have more events in store for you for 2021. And next up is our main event, the Planet Microcap Showcase Virtual, which will be taking place April 20 through 22nd, 2021. We are currently updating the website right now, but if you want to check out last year's event, full details are at planetmicrocapshowcase.com. More details to come here. We have a new episode in store for you on the Investors Roundtable. This week, we chat about participating in virtual events. Uh, I, I promise this is not a self-serving episode, and anything they say about our event was completely unsolicited. This is really all about learning from other investors, you know, about how they're interviewing management teams, talking to management teams, assessing new ideas during these virtual times. And you will be able to watch this episode on the SNN Network YouTube channel at www.youtube.com slash SNN Wire. And another little programming note, I'm almost done with the catch up of all the past uh, investor roundtable episodes. You've probably seen about two a week. Um, I'm almost done. I think there's like another two weeks of that to get me all caught up. So I know I've been kind of filling up your feeds with that, but I promise in like two weeks, it's just going to be two episodes a week, one from Planet Microcap and one of the Investors Roundtable. Now, for this episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, I spoke with Joe Boscovich. He is the founder and co-partner of Old West Investment Management. We actually did an interview uh, for the SNN Network YouTube channel where we did a deep dive on Joe's investment strategy there. So I, so I invite you all to check that out. Um, but really for this episode, Joe recently published a write-up on Howard Jonas, an investor who has built a billion-dollar empire who, according to Joe's write-up, and I quote here, founded IDT Corporation in 1990 as a provider of a call reorganization service. He took his company public in 1996 and built it to the point where today it generates $1.5 billion in revenue per year from the sale of communications and payment services. IDT has also been incredibly successful at creating value for its shareholders by using the cash flows from its core business to fund a wide array of growth initiatives. In the past decade, IDT has spun off five public companies and sold a sixth, after which it provided a special dividend to shareholders, end quote. Howard is one of the best microcap investors, founders, CEO, capital allocators you've never heard of. 
And Joe has done a ton of work and due diligence on him and all of his businesses. So, you know, we're just having a, a great chat about someone who's really contributed a lot to the microcap ecosystem over the years. So thank you again for tuning in to episode 156 of the Planet Microcap podcast. And please enjoy my conversation with Joe Boscovich. everybody to the Planet Microcap podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft. And joining me right now is a very special guest. All the guests are special. This one, you know, we did a YouTube video. Now we're doing this. And, and we got a really cool, interesting topic that we're going to be doing today. But uh, joining me right now is Joe Boscovich. He is the co-founder and partner at Old West Investment Management. Joe, what's going on, man? How you doing? Hey, Bobby, how are you doing? Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm good. You know, just another another beautiful day in digital LA, right? You're actually you're actually you know as a as a you're a neighbor here. You're actually at your exactly. office. Today, so that's good. Your background, and I'm I can see the back of your head from my office building, right? Now. I'm, oh, I really? Think, Wait, so which which building right is there. yours? Uh, what? Yeah, I'm, I'm right. Uh, that one. Right there, yeah, right in the center. That's that's my that's my building right there. So oh nice. Oh, so you can attest. You can look out your window right now and tell everybody all the snow that you Very see tough. on the mountains right now, right? No snow, no snow. Maybe in the <laughs> yeah, maybe. In the By the way, anybody who's listening to this audio version, uh, go check out the YouTube version and uh, you can see firsthand Joe's office. This is like a three dimensional type thing. We're 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 really truly virtual now, but um. Let's cut to the chase today. You know, the one of the things that I want, the, the main reason I want to have you on today is that you actually, you wrote, well, firstly, Old West is a, a, an investor in a number of Howard Jonas companies, uh, IDT and, and the spinoffs. And I, I thought it would be pretty interesting today because you wrote this, uh, a great piece talking about uh, all of Howard Jonas's uh, uh, companies that he owns and, and, and then also your investment thesis as to why uh, Old West has positions in these companies. So I, th I thought it'd be pretty interesting to talk about, you know, Howard Jonas as an investor and, and how your investing philosophy and strategy really aligned with what he's been doing uh, over his career. So, you know, I thought it would be a good idea to first start off with, you know, giving our audience kind of an overview of your investing style and philosophy, and then we'll kind of cut in to uh, kind of our main point of what we're doing today. So uh, the floor is yours, Joe. Yeah. Thanks, Bobby. Um, so, so our firm is Old West Investment Management. We've been around for, for 10 years, a little over 10 years. And, uh, you, you know, we are value investors. Um, you know, with that said, we spend a lot of time trying to identify the catalysts that will unlock that value because cheap stocks are usually cheap for a reason. Um, so we, you know, end up looking at a lot of special, special situation oriented investments, investments where, um, you know, we think there are very asymmetric opportunities where uh, we could um, understand our downside, but the, the upside is significant. Um, but then really, you know, one of the cornerstones of our process uh, would be that we want to invest um, in companies led by great management teams and, you know, owner operators that have more to gain or lose through their ownership than they do through their compensation. Um, you know, so therefore we, we look at uh, people that have allocated capital effectively over over their careers and have track rec records of success. And, and uh, so that kind of, you know, leads us into Howard Jonas and, and uh, you know, similar to, you know, John, a John Malone or a Warren Buffett or companies like that where we go, okay, this is interesting. He has a great track record of success. Let's dig in more and, and try to understand, um, you know, what's here and where there's opportunity. Um, that's, you know, kind of what we've done uh, with Howard. And, you know, Howard's a little different than I think the John Malone's and the Warren Buffett's is he's a little bit under the radar. And I think some of it is because he's not as promotional as the other guys. And um, which I, you know, which I think is a, is a strength, but, um, you know, really, I, I just think Howard possesses a lot of the qualities that you look for in a great visionary and, and entrepreneur. Um, you know, I would say, 
for starters, he's, he's relentless and he never gives up. And I think that's a very important quality. And in one of his, his books, he, he talks about this, this fictional character that he, you know, goes to battle with every day. And, and sometimes that beast wins and sometimes he wins. Um, but the key is, is, is that every day you go to battle again. And right when you start thinking you're pretty good, um, it knocks you back down. And, um, this fictional character never gives up. So the only way to beat it is to be as relentless as it is. And I was going back and forth with someone on Twitter a couple of weeks ago, and they were saying how they you know love Howard because if it's like if, if option A doesn't work, then he's on option B, and then he's on option C, and then he's on option D, and it's um you know eventually he succeeds. So um, I think he's relentless. He never gives up, and and he's always um you know, he keeps trying new things to get ahead. So I'd say, you know, that's one, uh, you know, two, I think he's highly intelligent and he's a great entrepreneur. Um, you know, he started his first business when he was 14 in high school and college, he ran a, a mail order business that grew pretty sizable. Um, you know, out of college, he started, a, a an advertising and brochure distribution business, and that grew into a pretty sizable operation. And then obviously, and 1990, he, he started IDT and has really grown that into an amazing conglomerate. And uh, we'll talk about that more. Um, you know, and, then, and then lastly, and, and most importantly, I, I, think, I, I think Howard's a good person. You know, he, he believes in um, giving uh, people chances. Um, if you look at his organization, he oftentimes hires people with, with, you know, unlikely backgrounds, but, but he sees great potential in them. Um, you know, he believes in, in, in second chances, you know, for people that have maybe uh, swung big and, and, and missed and, and failed in, in, in prior endeavors. Um, but, you know, oftentimes he gives people like that the opportunity with an IDT. Um, he believes in giving people uh, autonomy and, and believes in making his people feel as if they're working for themselves. Um, you know, one of my, my favorite uh, Howard quotes is that the, the line between success and failure is pretty thin. And um, I think that really impacts the way he manages his business. Um, yeah, he's, he's married to his high school sweetheart. They've been married all these years. Uh, I think that says something about the, you know, integrity of a man. Um, he has nine kids. He's a good father. Uh, so I think his, you know, that, that says something about his priorities, you know, and, and, and then, and then most importantly, um, you know, I met Howard about five years ago and he's been extremely fair and honest in my dealings with him. And I, I'm a firm believer that you, you know, you, you come to your conclusion about someone the way they've treated you. And it's, uh, I've, we've enjoyed being a shareholder. We've, you know, done very well in a few of his investments. Um, and, uh, you know, the crazy thing is, I think is his, we'll talk about what he's accomplished thus far, but I think his, his biggest business successes are still ahead of him. All right. So, so my, my first question, there's, there's a lot we're going to break down there. And, and that's, I, I mean, that was a great start and overview on, you know, getting an idea of who Howard Jonas is and, you know, what, has some of the characteristics that have helped get him to where he's at today, you know, but for you personally, cause you know, look, we're in the micro cap space. Uh, I, I know you don't just invest in micro caps, but you know, it doesn't matter. You're talking to management teams on a consistent basis. So clearly, you know, in your conversations with him and especially, you know, it reflects in the portfolio and that you're supportive of his deals is that there is something about him that, you know, captured your attention. And, and I mean, you, pretty much said a good amount of that already, but you know, when, how did you first come to find Howard Jones? You know, it, was it, was it through IDT? Was it through one of the spinoffs? I mean, what, what was it? What was the first thing that got you uh, first interested in learning a little bit more about Howard and, and how he, he conducts his business? Yeah. So uh, about five years ago, I, I read a shareholder letter um, uh, discussing IDW media and, and so IDW Media, and we'll go back a little bit later, and I can walk you through the timeline of when he spun off businesses, but it was one of his spinoffs. And, you know, IDW Media was essentially one of the largest comic book companies in the world. 
and he had bought that asset in, in the uh, early 2000s. And then um, I think it was in 2009, he decided to, to uh, take the cash that that comic book business was generating and was paying a small dividend at the time. And he canceled the dividend and decided to take that cash and invest in television production or television entertainment business and turn some of its IP into television shows. And, you know, at the time, um, uh, you know, the company had a very tiny market cap um, and you were really paying a, a small multiple of earnings uh, for just the comic book business. And it, you almost had this free option on the entertainment division. And, you know, so that's when, that's where we got involved. And, and, and um, so I noticed you know, at that time that it, it was the people running the company, the CEO uh, was, was the guy that started the comic book business. And they really didn't have uh, much, much expertise from the, 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 the television and entertainment business, which is a very different business. And one of our clients um, is, is uh, kind of an iconic individual in the, in the television entertainment business. And I just wanted to, you know, introduce him to Howard thought maybe, um, he could, uh, you know, help them and, and provide guidance. And uh, so I actually uh, flew to New York. I had dinner with Howard, um, you know, to talk about IDW Media. And, uh, you know, the funny thing, and we'll talk about one, the, the Raphael, which is another one of his spins later. But, you know, the funny thing about that dinner is, um, and at that time, I knew very little about IDT. And I knew really nothing about any of the other spins. I knew nothing much. I, I, at that time, I really did not know much about straight path communications, which is one of the spins where you just knocked the ball out of the park and became a billionaire with that spinoff. Um, so post that dinner, it really led me to, um, you know, explore kind of that entire ecosystem. But, um, you know, I'll never forget that dinner because we, we sat down and we started talking about IDW Media and he probably spent, you know, I don't know, the first minute talking about IDW Media. And then he went into, you know, cancer and curing cancer. And, and I was just really confused because I knew nothing about IDT. Didn't know how we just went from television, entertainment, and comic books to cancer. Um, but I loved Howard's passion and his vision. And uh, anyways, th th that kind of led me to... to diving deeper and, and, and just really learning more about this conglomerate of businesses that he's created. And uh, it was a fun learning process. Maybe I, I really did a deep dive for, you know, three or four months after that and uh, really enjoyed um, learning, like I said, about that entire ecosystem. And that's led us to owning, we own all, all of the businesses and some of the businesses we've, you know, received those shares through spinoffs and, uh, you know, in some cases, we bought them independently on the open market. Um, but, you know, not only have I enjoyed my relationship with Howard over the years, but I've really enjoyed getting to know uh, many of the different management teams at these different companies. And, you know, one of the things that you do realize and, you know, whether you in all these great business books you read, right, whether it's the outsiders or where they talk about, you know, great entrepreneurs and capital allocators, what you do realize is that each of these independent businesses, it's not you know, Howard necessarily just solely by himself running the show, there's real management teams behind all of these companies and the people running these businesses are very impressive in their own right. So take us back. I think it would be cool because in that paper that you did, you literally went through the whole genesis from, I mean, you didn't talk about the hot dog stand, but you did, but, but you started with the, by the way, I, I mentioned that because uh, in my prep for this interview, I, I watched the interview that he did a couple of years ago where he talked about his entrepreneurship experience. I highly recommend everybody go and check that out because he, he really does a good job explaining his mindset and his mentality. He's really quite open with his thought process and his mentality. But, you know, from a, let, let's talk from a business perspective. Can, can you give the genesis from IDT to where we're at today and how, you know, not just IDT started and where it got to, but then the sale of Straight Path to Verizon, I think it was for about 3.1 billion, you know, and then, and then all the other spins uh, up until where we're at right now. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's funny and it's made me, you know, realize, you know, how complicated it is to understand some of these businesses because it's not enough, you know, like with Raphael, for example, 
right? It's the most recent spin and they have a biotech asset. And, you know, if you just approach it from today and, you know, someone says you should look at Raphael and, and you don't know, you know, the back history and you don't know, you know, how IDT started and you didn't know that, you know, when Howard went to high school at Bronx Science and at one point he thought he would be a doctor and it's just it, if you just don't, it's almost like you need to start from the beginning. And that's why, you know, I have so much admiration for, um, you know, some of these managers out there that, you know, have kind of mastered the John Malone, uh, you know, complex and ecosystem. Um, it's pretty hard to follow it all. Right. And so you really need to kind of start from the beginning. And um, so, you know, as I mentioned, Howard, uh, graduated from Harvard, started an advertising brochure distribution business, which grew into a pretty sizable asset. And actually, he still owns that company today. It's called CTM Media. Um, and he actually just bought that company from um, uh, IDW Media uh, uh, because, you know, in the middle of this pandemic, as you would imagine, brochure, brochure distribution and advertising, you know, one of their big clients is Broadway and and that business is kind of non-existent right now. So he, he kind of rescued IDW Media by buying that asset. And, and you know, I, I think some people push back because they don't like the, the, the price that was paid for, for for CTM. But, you know, you can make an argument that the business is worth nothing today. Um, but anyway, so, so he started that business and, and uh, out of college. And then, as I said, in 1990, he started um, IDT, which stands for International Discount Tele uh, Telephone, and he kind of fell into that business um, by mistake. And uh, what I mean by that is, is so one of his key employees in the in the advertising and brochure distribution business um, approached him and said that he was uh, moving his family to Israel for uh, for religious reasons. And so Howard was kind of faced with a tough decision to make. He you know either finds someone else to fill that spot or he allowed allows that employee to you know work overseas and at that time their uh, advertising business i think roughly 50 percent of the sales were international and 50 percent of the sales were domestic in the united states so we thought you know you know whatever he could work from overseas we'll make this work uh so he moved his family and was running that business from overseas and all seemed to be going well until howard uh, got the first phone bill and he had noticed that, that the phone bill was like five, six X, um, more than it was the prior month. And the reason for that was because, um, when you make a phone call from the United States overseas, well, there's a lot of competition. Um, so you can't gouge your customers, but when you're making that phone call from overseas into the United States, a lot of these countries, well, there were local monopolies that dominated that business so they could gouge price gouge their customer um so howard kind of i mean he invented the callback business which which i mean to you know break it down um if you're making a, a telephone call from europe or somewhere overseas you're making on on uh, a telephone line from that country and when you call to the united states um similar to, if you recall, uh, like a collect call, right? So similar to the United States, uh, you call the States, um, they don't answer that call, and then it calls you back on a U.S. line. So it's a lot cheaper. I mean, you remember back in the day when you would, right, make a collect call, and then whoever you were calling, um, you know, they could accept the call or not not accept the call. And if they didn't accept it, then they could call you back and, and avoid that charge. So um, that's, that, that's how he invented the callback business. And, um, uh, you know, at first it was done, uh, uh, with, with live operators and it was a very, um, you know, person intensive, uh, business. And then, you know, Howard's team invented a, a box to, to mechanize the process. And, and so that's, that, that's kind of how the, you know, the international callback business was invented. Um, you know, then fast forward uh, in 1996, IDT went public. And when it went public, Howard, you know, on, on paper was now worth over $100 million. Uh, shortly after IDT went public, um, uh, they started a subsidiary company under IDT called Net2Phone, which there's a Net2Phone today too, but it's a different Net2Phone. It's they're using the, the legacy name. 
But they started NetTucon where he basically invented VoIP technology or voice over internet protocol, um, where they were the first to place television calls uh, or, or they were the first to place telephone calls over the internet. And so he really invented that business. He ended up selling Net2 phone to um, AT&T and Liberty Media for, I think, $2.1 uh, billion dollars in, in 2000. And then, you know, from there, really over the years, Howard, uh, you know, he's continuously adapted into new offerings in order to, you know, compete and survive. And, you know, earlier I mentioned how he's relentless and never gives up and, you know, how do you compete? How do you survive? So, you know, from there, I mean, at one point in the early 2000s, uh, the biggest revenue line for the company, and this is post net two phone was um, calling cards, I think 70% of their revenue at one point was calling cards. And obviously that, you know, business went away. And then from there, they got into internet service from there, they got into a, you know, discount long distance service. Um, then they got into payment services. And uh, like I said, they, they've completely evolved to the times and, uh, you know, built an incredible company to the point where, you know, today IDT does a billion and a half in revenue and um, they've built a great business. But, you know, so as impressive as his track record has been at IDT, I think what's even more impressive is his ability to continuously take the cash that that core business generates and invest that cash into basically a bucket of growth initiatives. Um, and, you know, these growth initiatives that he buys under the IDT umbrella, um, you know, some of them don't work out and, and you, you probably never hear of those businesses, but um, the ones that do, uh, he has either been able to sell those businesses within IDT or he has spun those businesses off into, into separate companies. So, you know, just as an example, I, I think one of the one of the early companies, and, and this was sold within IDT, but, um, you know, in the in kind of like 2000. 2003, 2004 time period, you know, Howard started talking a lot about how, you know, telecom was great, but it was a commodity business and really he wanted to expand, you know, beyond that and control distribution and own content. And um, with some of the proceeds from that original net to phone sale, Howard bought a couple of uh, small media companies and a couple of small children, children's media companies and, and built that into a, a business called IDT Entertainment. Um, did, did a couple of, there was a Yankee Irving was a, was a, a children's cartoon movie uh, that he put together. But, but anyways, you know, grew IDT Entertainment into a pretty formidable business. And I think it was 2005 or 2006, he sold IDT Entertainment to, to John Malone Liberty Media. Uh, that business was, you know, effectively merged in, into what became stars. And, you know, for a number of years, Howard Jonas was on the board of stars and, uh, you know, John Malone at times has had stake in, in uh, stakes in, in IDT as a, as, a, as a big shareholder. So, you know, they kind of go way back and have done a bunch of business together. But, um, you know, really, I think where Howard's story gets really interesting is, is, is kind of, you know, starting around the 2008, 2009, 2010 period, where if you, if you go back to 2010, so in the last decade, you know, Howard has spun off five different businesses from IDT. Um, four of those business are, businesses are still uh, publicly traded. You know, one of those businesses, Straight Path Communications, he sold for, uh, you know, a boatload of money. And that was his first, you know, billion dollar exit to him. You know, and net two phone was a billion dollar exit, but you know, he owned 20% of the company. Well, Straight Path, he owned about 20% of the company and sold it for $3.1 billion. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but so how do you invest? Had you invested in IDT in January of 2010 and you uh, still owned IDT today and then you kept the, the spin spinoffs, um, you've made like 50% annualized over the last decade versus 10% for the S&P 500. And like I said, as incredible as that is, I mean, he, he close to mirrored that the first, you know, 10, 15 years of, of IDT. And uh, I really do is do believe his, his most exciting days are ahead of him, because like I said, there's, you know, four of these spinoffs are currently publicly traded. I think all are interesting. And then if you go back to IDT, he's still doing it at IDT. Right now, there's, you know, three growth initiatives within IDT. 
Um, one's called Net2 Phone, which is kind of the, the, the legacy name of the old Net2 Phone, but Net2 Phone is in the UCAS business. So they're, you know, that's like um, uh, cloud communication um, services for businesses, similar to like a Ring Central or, or um, you know, 7x7 seven seven Zoom. Uh, so they have that business. And I mean, if you look at that business, that, that, that business from ni- 19 to 20, uh, I think revenue in 2019 was 30 million. It was 60 million in fiscal 2020. So that business is growing, you know, a hundred percent year over year. And then they have a business called uh, NRS, uh, National Retail Sales, which, you know, they're in the point of sales uh, business and they have all the, you know, the bodegas, the cash registers at bodegas. Um, that business has gone from 6 million to 12, 12 million in 12 million in revenue in the last year. So that business is growing hundred percent year over year. And then they have uh, the, the boss revolution um, money transfer business. So international remittance and that business has grown from grown from like, I think 20 million to 50 million in the last year. So that business is growing over hundred percent year over year. So once again, you have, you know, the, this international long distance business in IDT, which is a, you know, kind of slowly shrinking business but he's taken that cash and he has these three growth initiatives or breakout businesses within IDT today. And all three of those breakout businesses are growing over hundred percent year over year. Um, All three, you know, at some point down the road could be spun off into separate businesses, just like the, you know, the four I just mentioned. So. Very good. Exciting. Yeah. Yeah. No, I uh, listen, like if anybody's listening right now, you know, when it comes to knowing the businesses that you're invested in, just take note of the, detail that Joe is getting into here because I, that that's that's the kind of due diligence that you want to really you just you want to know these business especially if you're going to be more on the stock picker path you know and and looking at individual names like that just I just wanted to commend you for 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 doing because oh. we don't we don't because we look we don't we don't do individual stocks too much on the show so it's 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 refreshing sometimes to get into it and hear you know the level of detail that investors do to really understand the names that they're invested in which hey it's your money it's your hard earned cash you want to make sure you understand them you know and that's something that we you know we talk about a good amount on here but it's it's refreshing to you know get into it a little bit but you know going off a few things that that you've said and in, in talking about Howard and some of his businesses. Well, firstly, I hope to have him on the show at some point because I'd love to hear more about uh, his his experiences talking with John Malone. I mean, that that I'm, I'm sure some of that's that those conversations is is just nuggets of wisdom that I'm sure a lot of people could learn from. And and of course, but you know what's interesting from an investor perspective, I mean, looking at Howard Jonas businesses for you really hits your sweet spot. I mean, you know, not just from the value investor side of things, but you know, you like special sits. And um, you like uh, quality capital allocators. So using the spins as as your as your as your uh, I guess your background here or as your example set, you know, how has Howard's capital allocation strategy been so successful? You know, and and done, as you said, realizes fifty percent annualized gains in the last decade. You know, what what is it about how his strategy that you know, you as an investor, you're like, all right, I'm on board. Let's keep it going. Do another spin. Let's go. Yeah. So, you know, look, if you go back to to, to IDT and you, you talk about, you know, Howard competing and, and you know, constantly in, in his career, you know, he's kind of always, you know, been the little guy. And when he first started IDT and started the callback business, AT&T came after him, and, you know, try to try to get the FCC to shut them down. You know, he he prevailed there and went on and and um, so I think, you know, that that was one of the, the qualities that that first really attracted me to this business. And um, and, you know, just just his vision and, and realizing, you know, what what might be the next you know great thing tomorrow. And, uh, you know, we earlier I talked about how one of his you know first mega mega successes was straight path communications. Well, in, you know, 2001, when a lot of these telecom companies went went uh, bankrupt, and you know, at, at the time, um, I, you know, if you, if you take the seven or eight competitors of IDT, I mean, seven of those companies are all bankrupt today, and and you know, part of that is in you know downturns, um, debt sinks you. And one of the interesting things about Howard's businesses is Howard has always, you know, run his businesses with very little debt, and that's it enabled them to. Um, make it through the downturns, but, you know, in early 2001, 
when, when Windstar Communications went bankrupt, Howard spent about $50 million buying a kind of a hodgepodge of spectrum licenses for, from, uh, from Windstar. And, you know, I, I just think, you know, some of that vision and, you know, understanding what those spectrum assets could be worth one day, you know, and you talk about how, you know, 4G and 5G and, you know, some of these, these more recent technologies. And um, so, like I said, Howard spent $50 million buying these spectrum assets in 2001. He spun off those spectrum assets into a separate company called Straight Path Communications in 2011. And a couple of years ago, he sold that business to Verizon for $3.1 billion. Um, you know, so a couple of things there, uh, you know, you talk about your ability to be patient. I mean, keep in mind, he bought those assets in 2001 and here you are 17 years later. And, you know, when he spun that, that, that asset off in, the, in, in 2011, so we'll, so we'll say from the time of spin to the time he sold, that's about six or seven years. Well, the stock didn't really do much over that six, six or seven year time period. It was very volatile. And I think a lot of people gave up on it. But, uh, you know, Howard's ability to be patient and not really c- caring about the, you know, the short term, I guess, Wall Street, you know, you know roller derby. Um, um, but but it's a, that, that was that was amazing. Right. A, a 50 million dollar purchase becomes worth three point one billion dollars. And he was the largest shareholder. And that was a that was a huge exit for him. Um, and like I said, unfortunately, you know, we didn't own straight path. I, I wasn't really I you know, that, um, I guess, schooled on, on Howard at that time. But when you study the assets that he has today, um, I think that potential uh, still exists. And with a lot of the breakout businesses still within IDT, I think it still exists. So, you know, today, when you look at, at his publicly traded businesses, you know, there's IDW Media uh, that was spun out. Zedge was spun out of IDT. You know, Genie Energy was spun out of IDT. Most recently, Raphael Holdings was spun out of IDT. So there's four uh, current uh, publicly traded entities, and like I said, within IDT, you have you have Net Two Phones, uh, uh, UCAS Business, um, NRS National Retail Sales, and, and Boss Revolution Money Transfer. And I think all three of those could be spun out too. And then you know, who knows what happens down the world, right? And 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 then you know, I think what's really fun is when you study companies like Zedge or you study companies like Raphael, I think that, you know, what, what we may have been built here are little new IDTs being built in some of these other entities. And, and we'll talk about that shortly. So, yeah. And, and before we get to that, you know, my question to you, when in everything that you know about Howard and, and, and especially all the work you've done and, and his background and understanding him, you know, because when he's doing these spins, it's, yeah, there, there's, there's, what, what's, what would you say is the throughput line? You know, what is it that connects each of these spins where you're like, oh, that makes sense. And, you know, I'm going to go on this ride with him because he must understand something about what he's seeing here. You know, as you, as you said in that first dinner, you know, you went to talk about IDW and within five minutes, you were talking about cancer, you know, and, and, and not necessarily Raphael, I'm, I'm assuming, but just cancer, you know, so what, what's been, what was the throughput line? when you think about some of these spins that you're like, all right, yeah, I want to go on the, I want to continue on with the journey. Cause it's not like it's direct spins to another entertainment, you know, directly or, you know, something else related, you know? So what, how do you, what, what is that line? Yeah. Well, so, so I think with um, a couple of the spins, I, I think it's somewhat closely connected to, to telecom. I mean, and, and then media, and right. right? I mean, you look at a guy like John Malone started off in telecom and then branched out into, you know, media and and um, you know Howard early on. And when he bought when he bought the Spectrum assets from OneStar, you know, like, like as I mentioned earlier, he talked about how you know telecom is just a commodity, and really what he wants to do is you know own the distribution, right? right. Own the, and so that's kind of how you get in the media. So you know, straight path makes sense because I think spectrum is, is, is closely related to, you know, telecom and distribution of content. Um, you know, IDW uh, media makes sense in that, it, you know, it's owning IP, owning media. Once again, the distribution, I think Zedge makes sense because Zedge, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, like a content entertainment uh, app. Uh, but once again, distribution through the phone, the mobile device, um, you know, Raphael is really the one that, that, 
doesn't really make sense because you're like, how, you know, how, telecom to biotech, how does this even make sense? And, uh, but, you know, I, I think that's also the opportunity with Raphael because I think a lot of people kind of just skip over that because it's like, you know, this is completely out of Howard's wheelhouse. Um, but that's like, you know, with a company like Raphael, I think to really understand it and get there, what's really important is to understand how Howard became involved in that, that asset in the first place. You know, how did, he, how did he get there? Because I think a lot of, you know, fundamental value type investors, you know, they have this false um, image of their head of, you know, Howard wearing a lab coat, mixing concoctions, trying to, you know, cure cancer by himself. And that's, that's far from the truth. So I think with an investment like that, it's very important to start from the beginning and say, how did Howard get here in the first place? Got it. All right. So now let's get into your thesis for each of the spins that you're seeing right now. You know, what, what, what's kept you there? You know, what, what are, what's your, your thought process on each? Yeah. So, um, I talked about straight path. Um, I, I might kind of get some of the, you know, the timelines, uh, you know, mixed up here. Um, I believe the, the first spin was probably, uh, genie energy, uh, you know, genie energy, their, their, um, uh, a, a utility company, a uh, natural gas provider. Uh, they have a solar business. Um, you know, at one point they were, you know, looking for oil in, in Israel, but that's kind of turning into an attractive water company. Um, you know, I have not done the level of work on Genie that we've done on some of the other spins. We do own it in our portfolio, but it's it's not as, as, as outsized as a, of a position as some of the other ones. Um, but I think Genie is a very attractive asset. Um, you know, it's run by a CEO named Michael Stein, who I think is a phenomenal, uh, you know, business operator. And, uh, you know, that's just kind of a, a long-term, I think, compounder in our portfolio. Um, but, you know, I, from there we'll move to IDW Media, and I think I could talk much more in depth with some of these other spins. But um, so IDW Media... Uh, is interesting. It's been a little bit of a roller coaster. Um, a lot of people have given up on it. Uh, it at, at this point is a very small part of our portfolio, but that's only because it's fallen so much in price. And you know, we still have it in our portfolio. And uh, but I could see us owning it again. Um, you know, I think buying uh, you know around these prices um, and buying opportunistically at the right time, this could still be a great long term investment for us. Um, but so when Howard, uh, sold net to phone, uh, to AT&T and Liberty media, he took some of those, those proceeds and bought a, a couple of other, uh, content media related assets. And so, so one of those was a company called IDW publishing. We talked about this a little bit early on, but IDW publishing, they're one of the largest comic book companies in the world. Um, they're actually the largest license licensee of comic books, um, uh, you know, so they make the Marvel comic books and the Ninja Turtle comic books, which is a you know pretty stable business. They just receive a you know an up uh, basically a royalty on 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 sales of those comic books. Um, but then their other division would be kind of the, what you would call, I guess, creator owned comics, and this is where people are 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 taking something and introducing it to the world for the first time as a comic book, and um, they have you know, several popular titles in the comic book world. And in 2009, Howard decided to take some of the cash that comic book business was generating and turn it into to, to, to television shows. And they have had a lot of success doing that. Um, you know, their first show was a show called Winona Earp, which um, was on sci-fi. And that's actually been hugely popular. And Right now, they I think they just finished showing season four on Sci-Fi, and um, uh, that's had a pretty big following. Uh, they had a property called uh, Dirk Gently uh, uh, that was with BBC America um, that uh, got to a second season. It was canceled after two seasons on BBC America, and then they've had three shows on Netflix. They had um, uh, V Wars. Uh, which I thought was actually pretty good. It was canceled after season one. They had a show called October Faction on Netflix, and that was 
canceled after season one. And then, you know, probably their most exciting piece of IP is a, uh, is called um, uh, Lock and Key and Lock and Key had a season one on Netflix. It won a bunch of awards, was really well received. Uh, right now they're filming season two. I think that is probably one property that could have multi seasons. And then, you know, most importantly, I think if they develop it into a franchise, which I think is very possible, then maybe that lends itself to, to retail sales and, and, and different consumer product sales, which that's really kind of the golden goose. That's the, the high margin business. And, you know, as I've told you before with some other companies, and I, this is where I've always struggled with media and I learned maybe the hard way is, is, you know, the only proof that your IP or a brand is, is evergreen or a tentpole property should be borne out into consumer product sales. Otherwise, maybe it's not really, you know, otherwise maybe you, you, you get some cash up front from the, um, the content production, but then it's kind of gone and you have to start all over. So you know, look, I, I think IDW media is interesting in that they've built up uh, a library now where they've had five shows. And so I think their library is worth something. Um, when we first bought into IDW media, when it was spun off, uh, you know, I thought it was really interesting because you were basically paying a, a low multiple for, for the publishing business. Um, and you almost had this free option on the uh, television entertainment business. And uh, that proved to be right at first, the stock. I, I mean, when we first had it, I think it was maybe a $5 stock and it jumped all the way up to, I think, close to 50. And yeah, at one point it was one of the best performers in, in our portfolio. Um, and then it's kind of crashed down to earth and it's you know at four now and yeah, I think we opportunistically sold a little bit at the, at the top, but, you know, clearly it's a, it's a position a day where it's been a money loser for us. It's been the only money loser of the, of the Howard Jonas companies that we own. Um, you know, but I think the thing that I've learned is, is the, the entertainment business, the media business is not, it's not easy. It, it, it's a difficult business, you know, early on. Uh, they, I think that's putting it, I think that's putting it lightly. Yeah. <laughs> Early on, they, they deficit financed uh, the, their first two shows, um, Winona Earp and, and uh, uh, Dirk Gently, which, you know, I, I mean, th th that's what you want to do to really, uh, you know, control a lot of the upside. Um, if you do have a popular show, uh, you know, the, pro the problem there is you, you bear a lot of the downside risk. And you know, that's easy to do for if you're, you know, Lionsgate or Paramount or one of these other companies where, you know, if, if you have a show that doesn't make money in season one or season two, or is even a straight out flop, you can kind of bury those costs, um, you know, into your, your bigger business where maybe you're, you know, receiving royalties on television shows or something like that. So, you know, that was, that hurt the company early on. They, they learned the hard way. Um, uh, you know, with lock and key, uh, they're just receiving a, a, a straight up basically royalty from Netflix. So, you know, net Netflix is paying them uh, for each season and that goes straight to the bottom line. So they're profitable from day one with some of these new shows. Now you give up some of the upside, um, uh, but that's really kind of how you have to build a smaller media company. So, yeah, look, it, it's interesting today. Like I said, the stock's a lot lower. They've done a couple of offerings. So there's been dilution. Um, like I said, we've lost money in the name, but you look at the company today and it has a you know, $34 million market cap. They have 12 million in cash. They've paid off most of their, they've paid off, I think all of their long-term debt. Um, so it's interesting, right? So the day you own this publishing business, uh, good publishing business, uh, there's a lot of upside in entertainment. And, and you're not paying a lot. You're, it's a, like I said, it's a $34 million market cap and a third of the market caps in cash. So I think it's interesting right here. Um, obviously, they've been hurt with, with the COVID and kind of the lockdown of live action. Um, but I think Lock and Key has huge potential. You know, maybe at some point they could get the rights back from, you know, uh, V Wars, which is one of their shows that got canceled after season one on Netflix. And I think that that, that shows... Uh, you know, built a pretty good following. Ian Summerholder, who's kind of like a, a you know, a teenage heartthrob. He was in Vampire Diaries. Um, you know, he, he starred in that show. And yeah, I think if they could get that show back and, you know, maybe 
put it with another streaming service. I think there's great potential. Um, you know, I, I think IDW Media was probably a year too early with some of their shows and that, you know, if you go back, you know, even two years ago, you know, Netflix held all the cards and it was like you take Netflix's, uh, uh, you know, crappy deal um, or, 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 you're, or you just don't have a show where, you know, today there's Apple and Amazon, some of these other streaming services. So maybe you could get into a little bit more of a, you know, bidding war. And then, like I said, IDW, they've said going forward, you know, they're not going to deficit finance stuff anymore. They're going to do it um, really on that kind of pr production service uh, fee arrangement where they're getting a, a straight royalty that goes straight to the bottom line from, from the entertainment companies. And, you know, maybe that's not ideal because it's not the big money with the big upside. But, you know, if you could kind of, you know, hit, hit, hit it with a couple of shows like Lock and Key, if Lock and Key could get a season three and then a season four, then it becomes more of a franchise. And then I think, you know, Lock and Key, it's more sci-fi, uh, um, you know, supernatural, kind of like a Lord of the Rings Um you know, that, that would lend itself to consumer product sales. So I think it's interesting. Uh, you know, they finally, um, you know, they've had a kind of, like, like I said, early on, the, the CEO of the company was the guy that ran the comic book business, probably shouldn't be leading an entertainment division. You know, now they have a, the guy in charge, his name's uh, Ezra Rosensaft. And I think he's a pretty, he, he's a bright guy. I like him. I've enjoyed my conversations with him. Um, he came from HBO. He was one of the head finance guys at HBO. Um, I, I, you know, I think he's the right guy in charge now. They have a good, you know, team on the entertainment side. So, so we'll see. I, 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 I think it could be very interesting. Like I said, it's a very, very small position just because it's fallen in price. But I keep pretty close tabs on the company because I think if they could get a couple of new deals announced with new IP, uh, maybe they get, you know, deals with some of the other streaming services. This could become an interesting investment, and I think if you get in at the right time, um, not only would we would we really uh, lower our cost basis, um, but I think it could be a profitable investment if we just kind of play it right. So that's IDW Media. I think it's interesting. It's it, but, but like I said, it's definitely been a roller coaster. Um, a lot of people have moved on. I don't think they would own it again because they were kind of you know hurt owning it. But um, I think it'd be interesting. Very good. And real quick, I mean, you know, you covered Genie and, and uh, IDW, but you didn't talk about, I mean, well, you, you, you have talked about it throughout the interview, but you know, your thesis real quick on both Zedge and Raphael. Yeah. So, so Zedge is uh, really interesting. Um, we've owned Zedge since the beginning. I, I want to say it was spun off in maybe 2016 or 2017. And um so we owned IDT at the time and we received shares in Zedge, uh, you know, through the spinoff. Um, I really didn't know how to think about Zedge when it was first spun off. So Zedge was a wallpaper and ringtone app. Um, so once again, when Howard sold net two phone, some of the proceeds that he took and he bought IDW media, he also bought Zedge, which, um, so he bought it in the, in, in the early two thousands. Uh, it was, uh, I want to say uh, maybe a Swedish company, but uh, like I said, they, they were a wallpaper and ringtone app, um, which didn't really excite me because um, all I really know is how I live my personal life. And, you know, if you look at my cell phone or my iPad pad at any given time, it's usually the, the wallpaper is, is of my kids or my wife. And um, so I've never really understood wallpapers and ringtones, but, pretty incredible. I mean, the business was doing, uh, you know, 10 million a year in revenue. Um, they were, they weren't losing money. Uh, and they had 32 million monthly active users, which is kind of crazy. That's like a huge, that's a massive, massive number. And at the time, all their revenue was from advertising. So, you know, I thought, okay, we, we own the spin, we'll see what happens. Um, but I really didn't give it much thought. And then about a year after it was spun, they announced an acquisition of a company called Freeform Development. And I thought, okay, well, you know, this is, and in the press release, you know, they bought Freeform Development and said it, and it acquired its management team, a guy named Tim Cork. So I thought, okay, well, this is interesting. So I, um, you know, so first of all, what is Freeform? Um, who is Tim Cork? 
uh, and, and, you know, in the press release, it announced how they bought this company to accelerate its, its rollout uh, into creating a marketplace for artists where artists could um, market their content and monetize their content to Zedge's giant user base. So, you know, when I said that, I okay, okay well, this is interesting. I think this marketplace is interesting. You know, what's freeform development? So I, I Googled Tim Cork and there was a YouTube interview that he did with, with some uh, media, uh, a podcast. And I watched that interview and it was like an hour interview. And it was, uh, I mean, it was great. It was a great interview. And, and you know, so Tim Cork, his, um, he used to be a, a, a teenage punk band. So his background's music. And then he was one of the early guys with MySpace. And then he was hired by Google as one of Google's first employees to really build out the Android store. And at, at Google, his position, he was the, the, the vice president, I think, of, of uh, digital content. And so really his job was, you know, in this new digital world, how do you monetize all the different content verticals? And, you know, in the interview, he talked about how, you know, his experiences in this new digital age, every vertical is just getting completely destroyed, right? I mean, you talk about music when you had like piracy and now these artists aren't making the money they used to. And then you have, you know, books, right? Well, authors aren't making the money they used to because now you could just get a book digitally. And so really how all the, you know, all these content verticals have just gotten clobbered or destroyed in this new, in this new digital age. But the one uh, vertical that had just crushed it in the digital age was, was the gaming industry. So he talked about, you know, really what he learned. So, okay, so what is the gaming industry doing that's so effective? And you know, he talked about one of the things that he learned is how the gaming industry really stumbled upon this whole freemium concept of giving away your content for free and monetizing after the fact. And, you know, the example he used in this interview was, was the, the, the game Candy Crush, which is made by Kings and I don't know. I'm sure you've heard of Candy Crush. It's been huge. But he talked about how at first Candy Crush, it, um, you know, it, it, it was a paid app. You had to pay for the app. And, you know, no one was downloading this app because they had to pay for it. Um, so the creators of, of, of Candy Crush, you know, they said, okay, well, let's just give the app away for free. So now it's a free app and we'll charge all these in-app purchases, right? So like if you're stuck at a level and you can't get past that level, you could, you know, buy an extra life for 99 cents or you could buy you know, like a lollipop crusher or whatever for, you know, a dollar. And what they realized by doing that, now they went from not having any downloads to now they had, I mean, it was like 300 million users of, of Candy Crush. So now they had these 300 million users. And because it was a free app, all these 300 million users were downloading it for free. Now of those 300 million users, only a small portion ever paid any money but i think it was i mean it was something small like maybe one percent of the user base ever paid money but of that one percent user base i mean candy crush crush uh, was, was just making billions and billions and billions of dollars a year so what the gaming industry had figured out how to do was how to make billions of dollars and build these multi-billion dollar companies um in this manner so i thought you know that, that that was just really interesting to me and kind of like a light bulb went off on my head in, in my head. And I said, and I, and I, I, I said, I think I get it. And what it is, it, it was, what, what, I finally understood what Howard Jonas, I think knew and what Jonathan Reich, who was the CFO at the time. Now he's the CEO knew. And that is, it was never about wallpapers and ringtones. It was about the 30 million monthly active users and how could you monetize that user base? beyond just traditional wallpapers and ringtones. So that's kind of what they, they've done. And, you know, we owned it in the portfolio. We bought a little bit more. I think it was a 2% weighting in our portfolio just because it was really small at the time. It had like a $15 million market cap. And, um, you know, once again, to go back to that Jonas quality of never giving up and just keep on trying things to get ahead, you know, they, they built out this, this uh, marketplace, right, where artists you know, painters, digital artists, photographers, musicians, they could put their content in Zedge Premium, which was the new, the new marketplace they were building. And the user base could um, download things for free, monetize after the fact, and, 
And uh, it seemed to be a pretty interesting, you know, marketplace. So one of the things I did early on is I just went in the app and, you know, they had all these artists, painters, photographers, and I, I would just reach out to these, these photographers on Instagram and just say, Hey, just, you know, I saw your stuff on Zedge, uh, interested, you know, what, what are your thoughts? And some of these, you know, messages I was getting back, it was, I mean, I mean, I, there were, you know, photographers saying, I, I think this is, you know, this is the best business relationship I've entered, I've ever entered into, you know, I'm making a thousand dollars a quarter. Well, you think if you're some photographer and you're, you know, a struggling photographer, you're making, I don't know, 30 grand a year, you're making a thousand bucks a quarter with Zedge. Um, you know, and uh, other artists got back to me and said, well, I'm not really making that much money, but you know, since I joined Zedge, my, you know, Instagram following is doubled. And, you know, as you know, if you're an artist, whether you're an interior designer, my wife's an interior designer, and I know with my wife, it's like, you know, Instagram, that's the new portfolio for a lot of artists. So it was interesting what they were building. And, you know, it, it really hadn't translated into, you know, revenue and growth for the company yet um, until recently. And I mean, if you go to this last quarter, Zedge's, you know, revenue grew 85% year over year. Um, but what's interesting is, you know, all along their revenue was always tied to advertising, you know, like when you're on an app and you get a pop, pop up app from something else, that was their, their former revenue. But about a year ago, like I said, they, they keep on trying new things to get ahead. So about a year ago, Jonathan Reich, the CEO, he launched a subscription service where you could bypass the ads for, for, you know, and it, like I said, that that's been a big hit. If you look at this last quarter, paid subscribers and subscription revenue grew two hundred and five percent year over year. So, I mean, that really seems to be hitting. And then, you know, really exciting what they did most recently is they launched another app called Shorts. And Shorts, it's it's a it, it's a short form uh, content entertainment app. It's like short for storytelling through text messages. And now they're launching a podcast element to it. So now, once again. This is kind of out of that original, you know, the original Zedge app. But what they're doing is they're using the Zedge, the, the, the legacy Zedge app as a, as a cheap um, uh, way to get new subscribers, right? So they're, now they're advertising shorts within the Zedge app and they're getting downloads at shorts. And so really it's almost maybe turning into a little bit of kind of like a, like a mobile app marketplace where, now you have Zedge, you have Zedge Premium, you have Shorts. Um, like I said, the last two quarters, they really seem to have hit a stride. I mean, the stock, it was $1.50 uh, three months ago, and the, the, the stock's uh, six bucks right now. So it's been, a, it's been a big winner for us. It's now grown to a pretty large position. I think it's a 6% uh, uh, piece of our portfolio. And, you know, tempted to, to, to trim it now that it's that big, but... You know, the one thing I've learned about businesses like Zedge, these, these kind of business to consumer marketplaces, um, these businesses have great network effect properties, right? Where it's like the bigger they get, the stronger they get. And, you know, so the, the, the more, the more now that their subscription revenue and subscribers has grown 205%, well, the more subscribers they have, well, now that's going to attract more artists to the platform. And therefore that will attract new users to the app and more subscribers. So it's this, you know, virtuous cycle where it just gets bigger and bigger and feeds off itself. And then, like I said, now you have the introduction of this, this, this completely separate app, Shorts, where now really what Zedge becomes is it becomes a cheap um, user acquisition channel for, 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 for Shorts and, you know, any, any other future apps down the road. Um, uh, about uh, when Zedge was spun off, the CFO of the company was a guy named Jonathan Reich. Um, Jonathan Reich is now the CEO. I've gotten to know Jonathan pretty well. I think he's, he, he's sharp. He's a hard worker. I like him a lot. I think he's the right guy to lead this company. Um, you know, once again, get back to what I said earlier about Howard Jonas, how he, you know, gives people chances. Um, one thing I've noticed about with a lot of, you know, Howard's companies is a lot of the people at his companies, they've been with him since the very beginning. They're one of, you know, their first jobs. Um, you know, Jonathan uh, had a pretty big position back in the 90s uh, within IDT. Um, and like I said, now he's, you know, he's running Zedge uh, and I think he's doing a great job. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually pretty excited about Zedge and, 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 you know, we'll see where it goes. We'll see where it goes. But I think it's, it's definitely exciting. Very cool. And then, you know, look, 
I don't want to take up too much of, of your time. We've already been over an hour here, but you know, you, you didn't even talk about Raphael yet. So I, I'd say real quick, as po- as quick as possible, let's do okay. Raphael and then we'll talk about Raphael that quick because Raphael is is by far the most exciting in, in, in my <laughs> It's like you said, the most you said the most exciting for last because it was the most recent spinoff. So okay, recent fair enough. Spin-off. So fair enough. good point. Um, there's two two different types of investors, right? So you have you kind of your like fundamental value investors or growth investors or whatever, but like fundamental active managers. And I think you know people that look at Raphael from that group. Um. So first off, so when Howard spun off Raphael, he spun it off with a couple of biotech assets that we'll talk about, but he also spun it off with uh, cash and IDT's real estate. So IDT has a, has a skyscraper that they own in Newark, and there's a couple of other buildings that he sold it, that, that he, he spun, the, off, spun the, the asset off with. And you know the point of it is the cash and the real estate would kind of fund the biotech through um, some of these, these clinical trials. So what's interesting is when you talk to the I, the IR team at at Raphael and, and IDT, you know one thing that they tell you is it, it's amazing how many incoming calls they have from investors, and the only thing they talk about is the real estate. So it, it's almost like, and if you go look at Bloomberg right now, Raphael pops up as a financial. So from the get go, if someone just said look at Ryan Raphael, you would pull it up and you'd say, oh, this is a financial company that owns real estate. So. A lot of people aren't even looking at it as a biotech asset. Um, and then, you know, the people that have watched Howard over the years and think Howard's a smart guy and a smart capital allocator, they're kind of like, well, what's going on here, right? This is like telecom and media and now biotech. This is completely out of Howard's wheelhouse. And like I said, they have that false image of them maybe wearing a lab coat, you know, mixing mixing potions. And, and that's far from the case. And then from the other perspective, you have these biotech investors and these big biotech funds. And there's one biotech fund that has a stake in, in a smaller biotech fund that has a stake in, in Raphael Holdings. Um, but the other, the, the big ones don't. So you ask, well, if this is such a great you know company, why aren't the big ones there? And I think from their standpoint, they've never even heard about Howard Jonas. So they're not even looking at this company because of Howard or who Howard is. And then they want to own Raphael Pharma which makes sense, right? If you're a biotech investor, you actually want to own the biotech company. Well, so A, Raphael Pharma is privately traded. Um, so you can't own Raphael Pharma. And if you did want to own a stake directly in Raphael Pharma, equity would have to be issued. But Howard controls the company and he doesn't need any capital because he's funding this himself. Um, so, you know, most biotech investors, like I said, they, 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 they just want to own the, the, the pharma private company. They don't want to own the holding company. And then even if you do want to own the holding company, you could say, okay, well, Holdings owns, you know, has a 51% cent economic stake in Raphael, but a lot of that's through warrants and it's kind of, you know, hard to understand, you know, directly what exactly you own. Um, so I, I just think it's, it's, it's complicated from the pharma side and it's, it's, it seems like a strange investment from the, the fundamental side. So it makes sense to me why you don't have a lot of people owning this asset. But I think what's really important is to understand how Howard first got here, because that helps you understand that Howard's not out of his wheelhouse and and it it shines a lot of light on what's going on. So, you know, Howard has sold many companies. He's a billionaire. Um, He's clearly a visionary. And uh, so Howard uh, was introduced to one of the executives at Raphael Pharma. At the time, the company was called Cornerstone Pharmaceutical was introduced to one of the executives at Cornerstone through actually, I believe it was one of his, uh, one of his son's friends. So I, I believe that his son introduced him to this guy at Cornerstone and you know, he was talking to him and said, well, you know, what are you doing? He goes, well, I'm working for this cancer company and, you know, we're trying to cure cancer. And, you know, Howard's talked to him for a while and said, this sounds very interesting. Um, I'd love to help if I can, you know, I, I, I love to join as a board member. Maybe I can give you guys guidance. So, you know, I think, and this is like in 2012. So, you know, at first Howard kind of did this as a, as a really a humanitarian, try to help and give back. He's always had a passion for 
science. As I, I, I told you, I think he was like pre-med at one point and always thought about becoming a doctor before he became an entrepreneur. So, you know, this is important to him. He's always been very passionate about helping people. Um, so he just kind of joined the board, right. To give back and as a humanitarian and he's on the board and he's watching this company over time and he's watching what they're doing. And he's very impressed with the science and he's sitting there and saying, well, you know, something might be here. And, um, so now this, you know, like 2012, maybe 2013, uh, Raphael farming was you know running out of cash and they were thinking about closing the business. And, you know, what you do see with biotech and tech all the time is you see these great technologies, but oftentimes they fall short of the, the finish line because they run out of cash. And it's not that easy to raise capital. Mm-hmm. So Howard at the time, he's on the board and he says, I'll fund you guys. I'll fund you guys. IDT will fund you guys. Um, in return, we want basically warrants and convertible convertible converts to to exercise to potentially own a majority stake in Raphael Pharma, right? So I think the way he structured it at first is you know, put up capital, but the big capital didn't come until warrants were exercised. And, and at that point, they would have a 51% economic uh, stake in the company. So fast forward more and uh, Raphael, they enter phase one trials. Well, so first off, the backup. So their medicine is based on a new wave of treating cancer known as cancer metabolism. So you have chemotherapy, which is highly effective, but kills a lot of the people before it helps them because it's so, it's so hard on the body. Then you have immunotherapy, which has been very effective, but doesn't work on all cancers. So this cancer metabolism was, was actually a, 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 the doctors that founded Cornerstone Pharmaceutical. They founded the company in 2001. And they really dedicated their lives to, to uh, uh, this, this cancer treatment known as cancer metabolism. We're, we're, to, to make it really simple, basically, in cancer metabolism, the, me- the medicine targets the, the mitochondria of just the cancer cells and leaves the healthy cells alone. So, you know, it's usually used as a combination treatment with a chemo. But what you could really do is you could ratchet down the chemo. And um, what happens is, is because because it just targets the mitochondria of the cancer cells and leaves the healthy cells alone. You don't have the same, a lot of the same side effects as a lot of cancers or, or a lot of other cancer treatments. Um, so uh, Raphael, they enter phase one trials for pancreatic stage four metastatic pancreatic cancer. And uh, at, at Wake Forest Hospital in, in North Carolina, and then in these phase one trials, they dosed 18 patients with CPI 630. And just stage four metastatic cancer, I, I think like less than 1% of the people live past five or six months. It's a death sentence. Um, so in these phase one trials, they dose 18 patients with CPI 613. And of those 18 patients, they have three or four complete remissions, which is, you know, statistically, I mean, I mean improbable, right? I mean, I mean, it's absolutely incredible. And, and actually one of the, the, um, he was included as a, as a partial remission because he hadn't been in the trial long enough, but, um, you know, he's now a complete remission and, uh, you could actually go to www.cpi613.com and he's kind of dedicated, uh, a blog to, to Raphael and, and this drug. But, um, this gentleman, he was, one of the uh, the complete remissions in this phase one trial, and if you go read the blog, you'll see that he just um, you know he's he's now been alive over five years and just started his I think like hundred and tenth treatment. Um, but it really does seem to be this this miracle drug, and 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 like I said, to have that many complete remissions in a cancer where um, it's a death sentence uh, is 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 pretty incredible. So. With this great success, I, I, I think it's almost like it was this asset that Howard never really thought would become what maybe it, what it appears to maybe be. So in 2018, he spun off um, Raph, Raphael Holdings. So Raphael Holdings includes, like I said, IDT's real estate. It was spun off with cash. Um, its stake in Raphael uh, Pharma. Um, which at the time, I think was like 15% or, 
but it had warrants to get to the 15, 51%. And over time, they've, com- they've continued to exercise the warrants. And now, you know, they still have that 51% economic stake, but I think now they're, they're, they're over 40%. Um, so they continue to, to commit more capital. Howard continues to invest more personally. Um, and then there's another asset called Lipomedics, which, which is a separate biotech asset, but no one, I mean, I, ver- I rarely talk about that because clearly the, 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 the crown jewel is Raphael Pharma, but you know, Lipomedics has a, another exciting cancer drug and colorectal cancer trials. They put up some incredible results. The founder of Lipomedics is a guy named Alberto Gavazon, who co-founded Promatil, which, you know, grew into a multi-billion dollar drug. Um, so it's very exciting. And that's kind of gets, gets us where we are today. When the company was first spun off, it had like a $4 million market. No, no, it's bigger than that. But what it, it was spun off at $4 a share. At the time, you were basically paying for just the real estate, the book value of the real estate. So you almost had this free option on, on, the, on the biotech assets. Now, it's grown. Uh, the, the stock's gone from like four. It's it's about twenty four today. So the market caps, you know, three hundred and fifty million. Um, but because of their stage one pancreatic trials, the FDA skipped them to phase three. They about a little over a year ago they launched a phase three trial for five hundred patients in seventy locations. Um, they announced in July that that trial was fully enrolled, which was a year and a half ahead of schedule. So. You know, what's exciting about there is you figured the doctors that are enrolling their patients, well, you know, you, you know, you're going to assume that a trial would only enroll that fast because these doctors are very encouraged by what they see. So that was in August. In September, the, the FDA granted, um, uh, gave them a fast track designation for, for, for that trial, which, um, at least from my understanding, what I've read, that greatly uh, uh, increases the odds of, of having an FDA approval. And that's just pancreatic cancer. They have a phase three trial for, for AML, which also just got fast track designation from the FDA. They have a phase two trial for Burkitt's lymphoma. They have a phase two trial, I think, for T-cell lymphoma. They just launched a phase one trial for uh, a soft cell sarcoma. And if you look at the res- results in all these other trials, it's equally promising. Um, you know, a big kind of catalyst for me, at least, was about a year ago, they struck an out licensing deal with Ono Pharmaceutical in Japan. Ono Pharmaceutical is one of the largest and oldest pharma companies in Japan. They paid them $12 million up front, $150 million tied to different milestones. And then it's like 12% uh, royalty based on sales. And they just launched their, their trial in Japan. So, you know, for a, for a company... Um, like Ono to get in bed with Raphael, you assume that they did a massive amount of due diligence. Um, you know, that's exciting. Um, and then, you know, another exciting asset is just recently, uh, about a year ago, they announced uh, the launch of Bear Institute, B-A-R-E-R Institute. And that's kind of their drug discovery pipeline company. And it's named after Saul Bear, who uh, you know, founded Celgene and just sold Celgene to Bristol Myers for, I think, $70 billion. And he's lent his name, uh, to, you know, to Bear to help kind of co-found that institute. And it's fully owned by, you know, by Raphael. Just today, Bear Institute announced, a, a, so really what Bear is doing is they're partnering with like the top think tanks and universities around the world, licensing uh, uh, compounds, um, you, you know, from these universities. They just today announced a deal with uh, Princeton University. Uh, that looked very exciting. So I think there's a ton of value in Bearer too. Almost think of Bearer as like the new medical IDT, right? Where now they're going to partner with all these universities and maybe spin off businesses from Bearer going forward. And, you know, one of the things that I said, you go back to when I had dinner with Howard, you know, five years ago, and all he could talk about was Raphael. At the time, I didn't even know what this was. At the time, it was still named Cornerstone. I, I was totally confused when he was talking about cancer. But what you realize is Howard is so passionate about that. This he's dedicating ninety nine percent of his time to this. But like I said, what's so important is to understand. I think how Howard got to Raphael. Right? It's not like he sat there and said, "I'm going to go cure cancer." It was you know taking very calculated, uh, making very calculated decisions, and it's kind of led to this over time. And now it appears like potentially to this gold mine. You know, they're supposed to have an FDA decision on pancreatic cancer you know, in the first half of 2021, 
you know, so now what's interesting about this is when you get back to what I first said about one of the things that we look for are very asymmetric situations. So at the current market cap, which is about 350 million. So, you know, roughly give or take a hundred million is in, is in real estate, less than a hundred million, but you figure roughly a third of the market cap is in hard assets. So the rest of it's in these biotech assets. Well, we talked about Lipomedics, which I think that could be very val valuable. You talk about Bayer Institute and partnering with the greatest universities, um, that could be valuable. And then you talk about what's going on at, at Raphael Pharma. And, um, you know, to have results like that in the phase one trial, to fully accrue a phase three trial so quickly, to know that it's not just the pancreatic cancer, they have all these different shots on goal. They have the fast track designation. You know, this is a situation where if we're wrong, a third of the market cap, like I said, is in hard assets. So if we're wrong, let's say the downside 60%, which I don't think it is because even if they don't get pancreatic cancer, I think they probably get it for one of the other designations. Maybe Lipomedics and Bearer are worth the, the entire market cap today. Just don't even worry about Raphael. So, but let's just say worst case scenario, you're downside 60%. Well, if they get approval, this is just for pancreatic cancer. This is the death sentence. This becomes standard of care. It becomes a $5 billion a year drug. And then you look at what these top pharma companies are paying for oncology, you know, drugs, they're, they're paying three to five times sales. So, you know, this just on pancreatic cancer, Raphael is a 15 to $25 billion company. Well, you figure they own half of it. So that gets you to about 10, 10 billion, 330 million. So you're talking you know, a 30x return. So, okay, so your downside 60%, your upside is 30x. Um, I, I just think that is that is the type of as asymmetric situation that you, that, that, that you dream of in the investment business. So we have a pretty big stake in Raphael and I'm, I'm super excited about it. Um, and it seems that the news just keeps on getting better and better. You know, we'll see what happens with these, with this pancreatic trial, but um you know, go read, like I said, go read that blog, cpi613.com. And, you know, he links to a bunch of different articles and talks about some of the other patients in the trial. And he talks about how, like I said, this death sentence, you know, he was one of, I think, four or five patients in the phase one trial where the doctors told them, you're cancer free. You have no evidence of cancer. And one by one patient started going off. The pancreatic cancer came back. They ultimately died. This guy that wrote the blog, he had the, the benefit of um, being one of the later, uh, later people to enroll in the trial. So, you know, he's never gone off the drug and here he is living five plus years later. And, and, and I think the most important part is at least he says in the blog that he is, he has a great quality of life. And once again, this is because you could really ratchet down that chemo to something that's very, very manageable. So that's really exciting. And, and then, like I said, we talked about IDT a little bit, but it, it's still happening at IDT. I think net two phone, um, like I said. Uh, so right now, if you look at if you if you look at IDT, so IDT's market cap I think is like two hundred and fifty million. Let me look at it really fast. Um, so ID, IDT's market cap today is three hundred and twenty million. Well, net two phone, which is the new cast business, they're doing sixty million a year in annual. Revenue. Well, I mean, now we're value investors. I think you should value something on you know a multiple of earnings, a multiple of EBITDA, not a multiple of revenue. But when you look at what other things are trading for, I mean, you take like Ring Central, you take Seven by Seven, all these other UCAS businesses are trading at like ten times revenue. Well, if you said ten times revenue for IDT, that's six hundred million. That means that just that one tiny breakout business is maybe worth double the entire market cap. So then you have NRS, which is growing 100% year over year. And I think that that, that, that point of sales business is a very uh, you know, profitable recurring revenue business. The internet. So anyways, you could spin off all these other businesses. My point is he's still doing it at IDT and who knows what he's going to do with company cash going down the road. And, you know, he's great. You know, he, he, he puts the right management in place and uh, we're big fans. Clearly. So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think we spent an hour and a half telling us that, how big a fan you are. But you know, I, I, to close out this interview, I, I, Joe, what what would you say is the number one lesson that you've learned in investing in in Howard Jonas backed companies? Um, well, you know, look, I, I think you know you got to be careful 
right? Because when you look at when you when you talk about following owner managers, and you know, one of the things that we do is you know, we go through every SEC form for filing daily and look at you know people that are buying stock in their company. If we see a CEO or a, someone on the board of directors or a smart outside shareholder make a purchase, it's something that's interesting to us, and you know, we'll dig in further. And that's you know one of the primary ways that we generate new ideas. But you also have to be careful, right? Because you can't kind of abdicate your research process to someone else and say, oh, we're going to do whatever he does. So, you know, you really need to get in and understand the numbers and understand how that business is going to grow going forward. Um, but, you know, one of the things is it's, it's like when you put together something, right? It's like if you don't have the owner's manual, you know, it's like good luck, right? So, you know, I do think too many people in this business are are, are quick to sometimes, um, you know, push aside what someone's doing with their own money and 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 you know how they're allocating capital and and you know, you, so like I said, we spend a lot of time looking at what they're doing. And, and, and interesting enough, if you look within that whole IDT complex, where is Howard spending most of his time? Where has he put a lot of his money um, most of his new money uh, seems to be within Raphael and that's part of the reason why I think it's the most ex- you know a- a- exciting asset and um, and like I said with the bearer Institute I-, I I really think that could become like the next IDT but in the drug business and you know obviously we've approached this very differently uh, we haven't approached this from from the biotech side but one thing that we have done is we've you know talked to a lot of people, in biotech to try to just understand what a lot of this means. What is this phase one, you know, trial results? You know, part of me when I sit there and say that, you know, those types of results have never been seen before. Um, a lot of that's, you know, me talking to different people and understanding, you know, what other trials have been out there before that. Um, uh, so anyways, I, I'm kind of getting away from your question, but, but I, I just think that, you know, I've, learned that Howard is a great visionary and it is probably smart to pay attention to what he's doing. And, and by the way, this same thing goes for, you know, Warren Buffett and John Malone. And, um, um, you know, there's a, there's a million other guy, you know, uh, IAC, right. The guys there, um, you know, what are they doing? You know, uh, IAC, uh, you know, several months ago, if you recall, they made the billion dollar investment in MGM and you go, okay, well, this is different. This is interesting. You know, they're kind of like an online marketplace company. What does this mean for you know, the future of, 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 you know, online gambling and, and, and digital gaming? And, but when you approach it from how we are, I, I, I think it just causes you to say, let's dig in deeper because here's someone that knows a lot more about this than I do. So let's see what he sees. Let's see what he sees. Let's see if it makes sense to us. Let's see if we could fit this within the lens of our research process and reverse engineer this idea. Very good. Sorry, I was just looking at the ISC story and they just uh, uh, saw today, they just announced that they're spinning out, they're spinning out Vimeo. Wow, that's that's big news right there, stocks. Well, so I, yes, yeah, so like we own IAC. So, so, so my point is if you look at our portfolio, you know, Howard Jones, um, I, you know, IAC and Barry Diller, you know, John Malone. I mean, you see a lot of, a lot of that's, you know, in our portfolio and, and um, I think it's going to help us to perform really well over the years. Very good. All right. So we're there, man, you know, cause I think I, I, I've taken up too much of your time already. So Joe, where can my audience go and find more information about you and Old West Investment Management? Yeah. Um, well, our website, oldwestim.com. Um, and then I'm on, on Twitter and, you know, Bobby, we've gotten to know each other really through Twitter. I think my, my Twitter handle is at Boscovic. So my last name without the H B O S K O D I C six, four. And, um, I know you would agree. I, I think Twitter is incredible. I, I mean, tw- Twitter, Twitter has, I mean, it's really been revolutionary for, for the investment management business. Um, it's, it's, it's awesome. It's amazing. I mean, I, you know, and the other thing that I would say is really, 
revolutionary for the investment management business, and this is kind of a, you know, a, 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 a plug-in for you, is uh, what the podcasting um, mm. uh, space has done. I, so uh, Toby Carlisle had me on his podcast maybe a little over a year ago, and um, it was great. And then I listened to a bunch of Toby's episodes, and then I, you know, I, I and I didn't know anything about the podcasting business and what, how important it's been for investment management. So then I remember I, th- I, I thought like, well, this isn't, you know, I come from, from a investor perspective, like I could do my own podcast show, but have like the CEOs of companies that we have on and stuff. And then anyway, so I was, I kind of was toying with that and then you just dig in more. And then I think you reached out to me and I was on your podcast. And then I was on, you know, Brandon Balo's podcast, which, um, his podcast is great value hive. And then just crazy, you like Jake Taylor and Bill Brewster and, you know, and then there's, and, and then you kind of go to these, like, you know, like Grant Williams podcast, the end game. And then you have, you know, Quoth the Raven and he has, so then I sat in the, Oh, uh, uh, John Boyer has a great podcast and yep. he, inter- you know, he owns a lot of the IAC businesses. So you listen to Boyer's podcast and I think they have, they have an interview with the head of, um, uh, you know, of Angie, and then there's another interview with the the um, uh, their 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 online business uh, uh, piece of the company. Well, and after after a while, I sat there and I go, okay, well, there's there's like a hundred amazing investment podcasts. So, I but the yeah. but the funny thing is, and, and by the way, I every show you just you just rattle off there. If, if you're listening, you made it this far, uh, <laughs> definitely go and, and check out those shows. Those are, those are some of my favorites as well. Um, but you know, what's interesting, despite there being so many, there's still a lot of room for them because look, we could have argued back in the day, like, oh, there's so many investing blogs. Like how do I have all the time in the world to read every post that people put out there, you know, and now you're hearing the same complaints on the podcast side. And that, in my opinion, means that there's not enough, um, especially on, the, especially, you know, in shows like what, what we just did today, where you're talking ideas, you're kind of talking through them and, you know, like uh, uh, Bill does a great, I mean, he's only had three episodes today and, you know, he's done a great job, like kind of, you know, talking through ideas and challenging questions. The same, Toby does the same thing. Brandon, I know does the same thing. You know, ours is more educationally based, so we don't do that stuff, but Andrew Walker's podcast. Is Andrew great. Walker, of course, Focus uh, Compounding uh, does a great show. There's so many good ones. So anyways, yeah. you know, after finally listening and discovering all these new ones i go okay first of all my podcast would be worse than all of these people's podcasts so i'm not even even a joke myself uh i'm not even a fool myself but um no it's incredible so yeah twitter and then and then the podcasting world is just i don't know i mean sometimes it's funny my wife will make fun of me at times because i just like walk around with headphones and all 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 day now just listen to podcasts (laughs) podcast at the podcast but you can there's so much to dude, learn dude i i was i put a joke out i mean it's not really a joke it's more of an observation but i put out something on twitter the other day i was just like i have to listen to every like i hope everybody puts their pod on well, i guess you can do it on spotify too but you know i listen to most of the pods on youtube because i just had in the background doing you know when i have busy work and stuff and i have to listen to everything at 2x i have to you know because there's just so many of them and like i've i've done enough editing and everything like that that i can listen to 2x and i can i can get it you know, but I, I highly recommend that to most people. If you can train yourself to listen to some of these shows at one and a half, two X, you'll be able to consume even more content. You know, um, it's a trained art, but you know, it's, I, I definitely recommend it. But anyways, you know, thanks for having me on. You know, it's funny, Howard, um, you just don't hear him talked about a lot. And I don't really, I don't really get it. You know, particularly he had the, he had the, you know, the straight path thing and, you know, you really don't. And what's funny, you, it, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there, but like, it's interesting because like, it's made a lot of investors career too. You know, is like, I know Connor Haley, he was number one on microcap club forever because of uh, the STRP uh, uh, acquisition right there. I mean, I think, yeah, he covered it like high fives and what did it get bought out in like a hundred and yeah. you know, some, oh, like, some, yeah. I mean, it was ridiculous. Well, it's ridiculous. Like I said, the stock was trading like the valuation it was like in the hundreds of millions. You know, a couple of months before the acquisition it was bought for three point one billion, because AT and T and Verizon got into bidding war. 
but you, you know, look, there's a lot of people that look at the straight path thing. And if, if you, if you study what happened, they basically, you know, got slapped by the FCC for kind of sitting or, or hoarding these spectrum assets. So they basically, you know, were told that, you know, they, they forced them to sell it and they gave them a, you know, a period of time to sell it. And anyways, they, he had that big monetization. And, you know, I've heard of some people say, well, you know, so much of Howard's track record was just in straight path and he got lucky. And then I go, okay, well, you know, what, what about not only did he invent the callback industry, he then invented VoIP technology. And then, you know, he's, he's competed and survived by being able to offer all of these other value service, um, you know, value services. And then, well, I don't know what was, so was his 1 billion, $1.1 billion sale of, of net two phone um, in the early days, at and was that lucky was his sell of IDT entertainment to John Malone for 500 million. Was that lucky? So, okay. Then he was lucky with straight path. Okay. So you're telling me now he's gotten lucky three times. And, you know, and then you look at, like I said, the business he's, he's spun off, um, you know, Genie has made a lot of money for shareholders, you know, Zedge, um, until recently, it looked like Zedge might just kind of be, you know, dead money. Um, and there were a few that kind of believed in it. And, and you know, I, I was one of them. But, but like I said, one of the reasons that I really believed in it, and, and it went beyond Howard, um, you know, because because Howard of of his companies, that's one of the businesses he's kind of maybe the least, least focused on Zedge, but you know, getting to know um, you know Jonathan Reich and, and spending a lot of time with Jonathan and and really you know kind of understanding the different verticals that you know he was thinking of. And then one of the things that I loved is I remember at times I would I would tell you know Jonathan. Um, so it's funny if you go on the Zedge app, one of the verticals they have are, are musicians, and. Uh, uh, where mu musicians could could market their content, and um, my sister is a country music singer in Nashville, and she's awesome, and she sh shared the stages with a lot of famous people, and and I'll give her a plug into it. Her name's Annie Bosco. Go, go Google her. She has some great stuff. But um, you know, so I so a Annie was actually one of the early artists on 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 Zedge, and I obviously being her brother thought this is great. You know, like we should be pushing music more and. You know, Jonathan, one of the things that I really liked he told me early on is he goes, look, he says, it's all about the data. We'll try all these different verticals, but, you know, what do our users like? What's catching on? We could see how they're interacting, right? It's all using artificial intelligence and all that. And, you know, it's like sometimes in business, the things that you don't think personally would work end up working. And, and, and so you go in that direction. So I, I really like some of those responses early on with Jonathan and the way he thought. And, and that's really what gave us the confidence at the end of the day to, to kind of go all in on Zedge. Um, you know, I mean, clearly knowing that Howard was in the background and Howard's resources were in the background and a push came to shove and they needed to raise capital, you know, Howard would probably be there to help the company. I mean, take coming like IDW Media. IDW Media would be bankrupt if it weren't for Howard. You know, They've had to raise money to clean up the balance sheet and how it's put in a lot of the money. Now, what's interesting, and one reason that a lot of people don't like owner manager companies, and you know this, Bobby, is, is they sit there and they say, well, you know, you get diluted and all that. Well, the one thing I'll say about how in, you know, we've, there's been capital raises in IDW, there's been capital raises in Zedge and a few of his other entities. And usually all the time it's done through a rights offering. So you could complain all you want about dilution. But that's your choice not to take part in the rights offering. So, you know, I do think Howard's respectful of shareholders. But so, so my point with Zedge is knowing that Howard's in the back, the back room and will probably help Zedge get to the finish or, or not, not to the finish line, but help Zedge get to the point where now it's a it's a, a company that could sustain itself where they're clearly there now. That was obviously very important to me. Um, so, you know, but, but, but each of these companies, it's not just Howard's involved. It's, it, it's kind of the whole picture, you know, go back to Raphael. Once again, I, I've talked a lot about with How, uh, Howard with Raphael, but, you know, go, you, I, I post a lot of the podcasts on my Twitter page. You can go through and, and, and filter it, but 
go listen to some of these podcasts with Sanjeev Luther. Sanjeev Luther, he's the CEO at Raphael Pharma. He's an impressive guy. And then go look at their board. I mean, they have they have a couple of Nobel uh, uh, prize winners on their board. Some of the top minds in the country, med- medical minds in the country are associated with that company. And then you talk about something with like, with um, Bear Institute, Saul Bear, really the guy that founded Celgen and just sold it to, to I, 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 forgot, I, I just said who they sold to, I can't think of it, but um, <laughs> Myers, I think he's yeah. associated with it. And then you look at this out license, the licensing deal they announced today for Bear, like as I mentioned earlier with Princeton University and the guy that they're doing it with at Princeton, his name is Joshua Benowitz. We'll go Google Joshua Brinowitz. He's one of the most, I mean, he may be the leading chemist in the world today. So once again, I mean, the, the, the people associated with some of these businesses are just, it, it's, they're top quality. Um, and, I, and I think that gets back to the quality that I mentioned earlier, right? Where Howard just believes in giving people chances you know, finding people in unlikely places and then giving them autonomy to, to, you know, importantly make them feel as if they, they work for themselves. Because I think we could all agree that, you know, some of the top people um, ultimately would like to have their own company. Well, you could keep them um, uh, if you make them feel as if they're running their own company, you know, and, um, you know, it's funny, I, I, before getting the investment business, I went to school at USC and I played football on USC's national championship football team. And, um, you know, save that for hour two to to mention, but you know, one of the things that was great about that team. Um, so the head coach was Pete Carroll, who everybody knows Pete Carroll. He's the head coach for the Seattle Seahawks. And he's, you know, one of the top, if not the top, uh, football minds in the world. Um, but the offensive coordinator on that team was a guy named Norm Chow. Um, Norm Chow eventually went on. He was the head coach for the Tennessee Titans, and then he was yep. the head coach at UCLA, one of the top offensive minds uh, in the world. Well, how did Pete Carroll and Norm Chow coexist? How did you put those two guys together? And I think this, you know, this this, this translates itself into great businesses, right? I mean. You do it by giving people autonomy, making them feel as if they're calling the shots and working for themselves. And I think Howard's been very, you know, very successful at that. And I also think, and this is a side note with the football thing, I think it's actually one of the other reasons that I was very attracted to Howard's business is when I, you know, said he's relentless and never gives up. And I talked about that fictional character earlier, right? It slaps you down. Most people don't get up, back up. You have to. Well, you know, when you play a college football at a school like USC, particularly me, because I'm not that good of an athlete. Um, I mean, I got my butt kicked a lot. And, How the hell uh, did you get on the USC football t- at that time? I actually, I, I earned a scholarship, but I walked on. I walked oh, on okay. it and earned a scholarship. Um, what position What position again? So I was a was tight end, but, but I actually was a starting long snapper for four years, and that's how I got on the, got on the field. But, but um, you, you know, once again, I, I, I think – and, and that's why I love sports and I, you know, my kids will play sports. I highly recommend that everybody has their kids play sports because there's not many things in life that, that, that teach you that mentality of just getting slapped down, you get slapped down every day. You have to get back up. And as you know, the investment business is very much like that because the second you start thinking that you're pretty good, um, you know, that, that that's when there's like a three year underperformance streak right around the corner, right. Coming right at you. So anyways, um, I don't know. I went off on a tangent there. Hold on. Well, listen, I know I asked you the wrap up question, but now I got to ask real quick. A last thing before we go, wait, which championship year did, or were you on both? Cause the there real, was two. The, the real, real one. Ah, okay. There it we go. The one that wasn't recalled, right? <laughs> <laughs> Who was that again? That wasn't, that was the, that wasn't that was the Oklahoma. Right. That was the. Yeah, uh, the one I was on was that was the first year of the BCS. Right, we won the AP that year, and LSU won the BCS championship, so it was actually a split national title. But the year later, that after that, where USC was the you know the BCS and AP national title, that was Reggie Bush's I think senior year, and you know they got they got in trouble that year, so they technically recalled it. But 
USC will reinstate it at some point. The NCAA, well, once once the athletes start getting paid, they're going to have to take back every one of those, like we're taking the title away in your Heisman. Like that's all going to be taken back. Yeah. And the NCAA's days are numbered. So, so, so it, it'll be reinstated at some point. So, and Reggie Bush, he's back on campus and SC has embraced him again. So it, it, it'll cool. be, it'll be an official national title. So soon enough. Those were the most exciting games to watch ever. I mean, Reggie Bush plan was just incredible. That was like around the time we first moved to LA and like us is, you know, we don't have an NFL team and you see it, Reggie. I mean, he was amazing. He was doing every time he got the ball, he did something amazing, you know, and you too, man, you know, you, you, you have to snap. Like that's important. That's a, that's not easy. I don't know if I could snap a ball, what, 10 yards, like on a dime right there. The thing about snapping is it's not, it's not, um, it's not necessarily the biggest athletic endeavor, but it's kind of like putting, right? It's like how many, how many putters, you know, can sink a 20 foot putt. So, so really it's more of a, it's more of a, uh, keeping your calm, which actually, once again, I think lends itself to investing, right? Cause I think one of yep. the key is be patient, not get rattled and think long-term. And, and so I, I actually, I think there's a lot of parallels between investing in sports. All right, we're going to save that one for the next show. But with that, Joe, it's been a pleasure, man. Thank you for taking so much time today and uh, dissecting the mind and, and investing career of Howard Jonas and in so doing yourself as well. <laughs> so uh, really appreciate you taking the time today. And, uh, you know, have a happy holiday and uh, we'll talk soon. Yeah, thanks, Bobby. Talk to you soon. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Podcast.